As a dog owner, you are concerned about your pet's well-being, but how prepared are you in case of an emergency? Well, today we're talking pet CPR and first aid with Sue Rutledge. She created and teaches a comprehensive pet first aid and CPR course. Hi, Sue, welcome. Hi. Well, I am so happy to have you on the show. Welcome to People with Passion for Pets. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. This topic is so dear to my heart, and we're going to be talking about pet CPR and pet first aid today. Um, And, you know, I think that anybody that owns a pet, um, especially here in Arizona, but really anywhere, should have some type of knowledge of pet CPR or pet first aid. I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm a, a very firm believer in everybody that has a pet. If you love your pet, you should, you should have a pet first aid CPR course. Absolutely. I'm a very uh, avid hiker and, and I usually hike by myself. So, you know, being out on the trail, um, I always worry about if something happens, would I be well equipped to know what to do? So maybe we can kind of start there. What are some of the things that, that you could suggest to people? So you need to have a, a plan and you need to have some sort of a, a kit or some sort of medical equipment that you can carry with you or at, at the very least in your car. Is there like suggestions on things that you would put together as a first aid kit for, for a pet owner? Yeah, so if you take my class, um, we do talk, we do a whole, a whole part of my class is on a first aid bag. And the reason is, is because if you don't have tools, it makes it much more difficult to help your animal in an emergency. And our a first aid kit, every household should have one. I don't care if you have a pet or not, you should have one. Um, and I'm always surprised how many people don't. Um, I went online and I looked for a first aid kit for pets specifically. I found one that looked really cool and it had a 74, no, 72 like items in it. And it looked awesome. And I ordered it and it showed up and it was about this big. You know, it had like 30 Band-Aids in there. Well, you're not going to ever use a Band-Aid on a dog or a cat because they have fur. So I, it was it was a waste of money. It was a huge waste of money. So I thought, all right, time to put one together myself. So I just took an old gym bag and I started putting things in into the bag that makes sense to me. I put blankets in my bag and people go, why? And it's because if I have to kneel down next to a dog that got hit by a car, for example, the cement is hot. I'm going to put that blanket down first and then put my knees down and then take care of that animal because otherwise I'm going to hurt myself and I'm not going to be able to help the animal. I have splints in there. I have bandaging material, dressing material. I have... uh, um, scissors, obviously, things like that, tape. I do have tape, even though I don't use tape very often. I have a roll of duct tape because it comes in very handy for securing an animal to a surface if I have to. That would be an animal that maybe had a broken neck or back. If you have a pet that has allergies that you are aware of, if they have specifically anaphylaxis, you might want to put an EpiPen in your in your kit. Other things A muzzle is a really important thing. A picture of your dogs and you. A lot of people think I'm nuts. In a disaster situation, you have to be able to identify your dog and your dog has to be identifiable to you as as yours. Um, And your phone may not be working. So your pictures on your phone may or may not be helpful. It's a lot better if you have a physical picture of you with your dogs and you can say, my dogs look like this. Um, this is me and my dogs. I also have um, cold packs in my bag because I'm in Arizona and it gets very hot here. So I do use things like that. There's saline solution in my bag um, that can be used to irrigate just about anything. I have uh, needle nose pliers in my bag and a comb again for the Choya, but also if I need to get any kind of splinter out from their skin, I, I need something I can grab a hold of. I have a tick removal kit because we do have ticks here in Arizona. So I have a very, as you can tell, a very, very comprehensive bag. Extra That's- leashes. Extra leashes is another one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you could even use a, a, a soft leash to make a quick muzzle. But uh, yeah, so great information. And I think uh, everybody needs to think about um, 
you know, what they want to bring and, and research a little bit the area that they're going into. We all don't think as clearly when an emergency happens. So it's a good idea to, to practice some skills. Um, for instance, we, um, we have an emergency rescue harness because my dogs are a little bit big. But if you have a dog that you don't think you could carry, you know, think about what would that be? You know, what would that scenario be? And then also maybe practice that with your dog. Absolutely. We, we In my class, we talk about, you know, preparing. It's prevention, prepare, and practice. Those, that, that, that's, the, that's first aid in a nutshell right there. Um, in Arizona, we, we tell people that the very, very least they should carry would be a comb. <clears throat> and people think that I'm crazy because I say you need to have a comb. And they're like, what in the world would I use a comb for? And I'm like, you know, if the media shows up, you want to look, <laughs> really not. That's, yep. that's a joke. The truth is, <laughs> it's the Choya cactus. That's how you get it off of them. Yep. You don't want to. I've seen too many people, you know, wrap their hand in their T-shirt to try to pull it off. Well, it goes right through that. And it's it's shocking. It is so painful. It is so shocking. Um yeah, I and you got to work. You got to move quick because the first thing your dog's going to do is try to get it off with his mouth, and then yeah. it becomes a more emergent problem. So yeah, yeah that's one of those things that uh, you know you really do have to be a, ahead of the game. You have to prepare and you have to plan for it a little bit. Yeah, I actually, uh, I actually have a video, and I'll uh, I will link that for our viewers on how to remove choyas with a comb, and also how to make an emergency muzzle for the dogs. Because, like you were mentioning, for the dog, right away they want to get this out, but of course, you know there are spines all over that piece of choya, and then they'll have it in their mouth, and then it becomes even more of an emergency than if it's just you know on their legs. Correct. Correct. A muzzle doesn't have to be something you purchase. A lot of people feel like they have to buy those wire muzzles and they have to carry those. And those are bulky and, and difficult. Now, I, I, I strongly suggest having one for your animal for situations where disaster planning comes into play and train your animal to be able to be comfortable wearing something like that. One of the rigid ones, not necessarily wire, but at least a rigid one. Um, but the soft muzzles, you can make one really, really easily. You, it doesn't require a lot of effort. And I teach that in my class. I teach people how they can do that easily. That's wonderful. So let's, uh, let's maybe talk a little bit about your class. So um, just to give people uh, some background on you, you actually created your own pet CPR and first aid curriculum. Um, but talk a little bit about why you did that. Sure. So my journey has been a little bit strange. I actually uh, retired from the fire service as a, a paramedic captain. And when I, which is, you know, a lot of people say, why do you call it? Why, why do we call you captain? See, well, that's, well, that's where that comes from. When I retired, I retired and adopted a couple of puppies. I got two, uh, six months apart. And one of the two had some health issues, some significant health issues. And after going from one vet to another vet, you know, spending hundreds of dollars, I really wasn't getting a, a satisfactory answer. And I thought, man, if I just understood it better. So I went to school, went back to school um, for vet in veterinarian medicine. And I don't want to be a veterinarian. What I wanted was I wanted to be able to take care of my animals. I certified in canine anatomy and physiology and canine pathology and disease. In the meantime, though, what happened was people in my neighborhood and friends and family who had pets when they would have an, an emergency or a situation they weren't sure about, they would, they would come to my house or call me on the phone and ask me, you know, what do I do? And is this something I have to go to the vet for? And, and I'm not a veterinarian, um, but I always looked, I always, cause I understand that position that people get in where they're just unsure. And you can't really call a vet and ask questions because they say, bring them in. I got to thinking, you know, there are a lot of people that just don't know. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to identify an emergency. They don't know what to do in an emergency. And so I said, well, there's gotta be a first aid class out there for pets. So I started looking and I took, I have to date, I have taken six different organizations, pets, first aid, CPR courses, and they're all different. And some of them have really bad information. Some of them have really outdated information. Some of them were in person. Some of them were online. And I, I never really felt like it was what I was looking for. And that would be something that didn't just address CPR. They all will address CPR. Um, but CPR is the end of the game. You know, that's when the heart is stopped. You're really behind things at that point. 
So with my background in, in the fire service, I have more than 30 years experience responding to emergencies. I had more than 20 years experience teaching all different levels of emergency first aid and CPR, uh, everything from babysitter safety to basic first aid and CPR. So I had a lot of teaching experience and a lot of medical experience. And then I got that veterinarian education. And so I thought I can put something together. And so I did. I, I did uh, put my own curriculum together. I went out looking for what the standards were, because with humans, there's a standard of care when it comes to every piece of first aid. In animals, it doesn't seem that they have caught up to that yet. And because of that, you know, I had to do a lot of research and put together what, it, what made sense from an anatomy and physiology standpoint and what we know works for people, bring it down to the level of, well, you know, if this is how you stop bleeding in a person, it's going to be the same for an animal because anatomically and physiologically it's, it's the same. So that's basically why I did it is because I just didn't find anything I liked. And my class is very different than other people's in that I put a lot of emphasis on what you can do. First of all, you know, having a first aid kit because I've taken classes and they don't even address that. And if you don't have the tools, it's really hard to do the job. So I have, a, I put initially the class was eight, eight hours long. It's not any longer because people just couldn't take that. Um, what I ended up doing was developing a uh, website and I put a lot of the prevention stuff on the website so that I could cut two hours out of the lecture right off the bat. But you know, prevention is the first part of, of, of first aid. And then it's um, preparation and preparation includes your first aid kit. Nobody was covering that. And so we're just leaving people to just, here's all the knowledge, but no tools. So we start there and then um, we then cover um, practicing. So we, we teach how to put uh, a, a muzzle on a dog. We talk about personal safety. You know, there was nothing on personal safety in most of the classes that I took. And, you know, if you get hurt uh, as a firefighter, as a retired firefighter, you know, there is, if, if you're part of the problem, you aren't part of the solution and, and dead rescuers rescue no one, you know, so we kind of start a little differently in my class. And then we start addressing, you know, um, what vital signs. How do you take a dog's vital sign or a cat's vital signs? Because my class addresses both dogs and cats. Um, how do you do that? What's normal? When do we need to worry? Um, that kind of thing all became part of my class. And that's, you know, something I didn't really get in other, other classes. Even the best class that I have taken from another organization, their emphasis was CPR. And we do that last because it really is the last part. And so, I, re I really like that, Sue, because um, you should probably know how to do CPR, but to be true, I mean, that's probably, hopefully, not going to happen. And most of the time, when you do all of the other things that you are talking about and that you're teaching, then hopefully it never comes to this, right? And, right. and you're prepared to spot the signs early, or you are prepared to even avoid any of those things. Right. Well, and the other thing too is it, most of the other stuff that I've seen, it isn't a dog that is pulseless or without respiration. It's a dog that's bleeding. It's a dog that's been bitten by something or stung by something. It's a dog that seizes and they've never seen it before. It's a dog that ate something that they're not sure that what they should do about that. So it's all the other stuff that I have seen from, from my personal experience that really trip people up. When you get to the point of CPR, yes, I think everybody should know how to do it. But even if you didn't do it correctly, that you're, you're probably not going to add to the problem. You're not going to make it better, but you're not going to add to the problem. Whereas if you've got some animal bleeding, you can add to that problem if you don't do something right. So I liked to, to, to my, my class, the first four hours of my class, you're getting a lot of other stuff. You're getting uh, trauma, burns, um, poisoning, you're getting environmental emergencies, you're getting all kinds of other information and we do hands-on. So when we talk about um, how to stop bleeding, we, I, I give everybody a mannequin and we, we go through the steps together and we bandage. 
we talk about fractures, we talk about splinting, we get to, you get to, you get to do this stuff. This isn't just something I'm standing up here talking about. That's really neat. And yes, again, and I think that is the part that um, speaks to me and where I'm saying that is really what I would want every pet owner to know. Um, because as you were saying, those are the things that could make things worse. And, and especially in an environment like the Arizona desert, um, you know, there are so many things that could happen here when it comes to rattlesnake bites or like you were saying, just even choyas or, you know, things that are really sharp and, and could injure a pet. Um, you know, and, and one of the things I think that people don't really think about is heat exhaustion. And that is probably one of the number one emergencies that happen um, in the summertime, uh, pro but probably not just here in Arizona, but all over the country. So can we maybe talk a little bit about signs of heat exhaustion? First of all, the biggest thing that I would watch for if it were my pet, and I have had pets where I've gone for a hike with them and we've encountered, um, I've gone too far. You, you know, if, you, if your pet's having a heat emergency, it's usually your fault. So I had taken him out in Arizona and it wasn't even very hot yet. It was in the nineties, which for us, we are used to that, but our dogs are still wearing fur coats and we were out hiking or walking. It was just in the city. We were out walking and he started panting heavily and dogs pant. I told you earlier that that's how they cool their bodies. They do have sweat glands, but their sweat glands are very, very minuscule and they're in their paws. So they don't really exchange uh, moisture to cool their body like we do. So it's really hard to see if they're having an emergency. For us, we sweat profusely and then we stop sweating and become beet red. It's hard to see that in a dog. So with dogs, what you're gonna be looking for is a change in how they're panting. They will thrust their tongue forward a lot more extreme than normal. Their tongue will actually widen a little bit, which if you ever see it, it's unmistakable. You, you can't, you keep, you, you, it, it looks different. There, um, they will be hot to the touch. So, you know, it, it, it's more than just the coat being hot. Like their ears will be hot. Their belly will be hot. And that's to, for, for you, if you would like to reach down and, and touch them and pet them, that will be hot. Their temperature usually will shoot up above 140 um, degrees Fahrenheit, that's when you're in a in critical, critical uh, area. But most people don't have thermometers. They don't have a way to, to judge that, or they don't even know what normal is. So again, something that we cover in my class is how to take a temperature and all of that. Um, the other thing is, is that they'll have brick red colored gums. So if you lift up their, their, their jowls a little bit, their, their lip, you should be able to see their gums and their gums should be pink, like normal, like bubblegum pink. And it should be slimy in their mouth because that's, they have lots of saliva and stuff like that. And this is part of vital signs. That would be what we would look for, for normal. In a dog that's overheated is be, becoming um, heat stroke or um, hyperthermic. That starts to get tacky and sticky and the color starts to get a dark red, like uh, like a brick red, like you see on a building. So those are some of the things to really watch for. They also will get really weak, and and they they they'll stop moving. You know, eventually they'll collapse and and die. So it is a serious emergency here. There's a couple of things I do want to mention about heat emergencies in Arizona. A lot of people associate that with hiking. It's not from hiking. Um, heat emergencies in Arizona can be just leaving your dog outside. Um, heat emergencies in Arizona can be leaving your dog in a car, even for a few minutes. And in the state of Arizona, we have laws that allow people to break the glass in a car to, to retrieve a dog. Now there's, in my class, we cover the law. We cover what exactly you're allowed to do and not allowed to do, because there are some not allowed to do's in there. You do have to have made contact with the police and have them responding before you ever take an action. You have to make sure that the doors are locked, you know, that you can't just open the door and what have you. Um, so there are some rules there, but it's so common here that they have made rules. So that's something we need to be aware of. And the other thing I want to mention about heat in Arizona, afternoons, I see this all the time. People will exercise themselves in the afternoon and they'll take their animal with them. Their animal cannot cool its body the way our bodies can be cooled. If we're out there running, we know we get too hot. If our dog's out there running, our dogs are loyal to us and we'll, we'll, we'll literally run until they drop. 
So that's really a bad practice. And I see that mostly with people that are not familiar with Arizona and the fact that because it's dry, we think it's fine. It's not, they're wearing a winter coat. And so for them, the, the temperature becomes really a lot more extreme, a lot quicker than it does for us. And one last point on heat in Arizona is the pavement. So in Arizona, it's very, very, I can't even tell you how common it is to damage the pads on your dog's feet by having them walk even a short distance on the hot pavement. It is hot enough to fry food. So you're literally walking your dog across something that is hot enough to cook on. And it will literally burn the pads of their feet. So, you know, I, I think if you're gonna live here in Arizona, just be very aware the cement, if you can't walk barefoot on the cement, it's not the time to walk your dog on the cement. Yes, thank you for that. And of course, um, you know, a lot of people say put your put your hand on the cement and if it's too hot. But, um, you know, one of the things that I always try to um, raise awareness of is there is a lot of people that obviously have to walk their dogs because maybe they don't have a backyard. Um, and again, it comes, you have to kind of think things through and maybe go different routes, maybe go to areas where there might be some grass if possible, because of course a, a sidewalk or a street uh, pavement is always going to be a lot hotter than maybe uh, uh, the, the ground or the grass area. There's a lot of people that use dog boots, which are great to use, but at the same time, they can also be difficult because as you mentioned, dogs do use their paws to cool off. And I think that is one of the things of preventing a dog or helping a dog that is maybe getting too hot is to take those dog boots off and let those um, paws kind of um, air out a little bit if you go for long walks with your dog. So if you had a service dog and you have no choice, those booties are a lifesaver for your pet. Um, otherwise, walk your dogs in the morning, walk your dogs after the sun sets. Um, grass is, is there are parks that have grass? Absolutely. Those are good options. It, you know, it, it is even actually better not to walk your dog than to walk your dog on the hot cement. Just plain and simple. So plain it. And, and it's, a, you know, I know it's a challenge and as dog trainers, um, we hear so many of our clients in the summertime that are very frustrated because they're like, you know, my dog obviously needs exercise, but you know, how can I prevent, uh, and you know, we'll have some information on that as well as the temperatures rise again and, and things you can do with your dog indoors to kind of stimulate them. Exactly. But um, going back to heat exhaustion and first aid, so can you give a few tips on how to maybe give some first aid to um, help a dog that is getting too hot? Okay, that's a great, that's great. So <clears throat> it's really, really simple, actually. If your dog's getting too hot, get them out of the hot. It's, it's cool them down. So there's two schools of thought. There's a lot of people that will argue with me about, I tell them, cool the dog down as quickly as possible. And there's a lot of people that will say, don't do it so quick because they can go into shock. The problem is, is that when you tell people don't go fast, they tend to go way slow. And the, hot, the longer the dog's temperature is elevated, the worse for the dog. So you do want to bring it down rapidly. So that doesn't mean throw them in ice. What that means is get them into an air conditioned room or a building. Um, cool them with cool, cool running water, not cold running water, but cool. And if you have a heavy, a dog with a heavy coat, you're going to have to, um, run your hand the opposite direction of their fur while you're cooling them with water because otherwise it'll just run right off of their fur and it'll actually make like a um, thermal effect where it prevents the coolness from getting in and it holds the heat in. So you don't want that, you want the opposite. So you'll have to run your hand the opposite direction of the fur as you're cooling with water. So I tell people if it's my dog, and this is what I did because I watched my dog his tongue went forward and spread really wide and then he wouldn't move. And, and I'm about a half a mile from my house and I'm like, oh crap. So I had to pick him up, carry him home. I got him home. I cooled him in, in the shower. A lot of people wanted to take the hose. I don't recommend that because our hoses in Arizona, while they're sitting there, heat up. 
And so when you first turn on water in a hose, that water can be scalding. It can actually cause burns. So if you have to use a hose, run it for a while first and then use it. Um, but I take my dog into the house, into the shower, cool him off, dry him, pat him dry. And then I just let him sit in the house and, and recover. If they don't seem like they're recovering or if they become unconscious, that's a get them to the vet emergency. Now, would you recommend that um, you give the dog water or um, like anything at this time or no? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give them anything to drink until the, the, the emergency portion of this kind of has passed. Two reasons why, if you give them water to drink, they're gonna vomit. Um, so you're not, you're not helping them at all. Um, and, and two, people want to give them ice, ice, ice water, and that's just going to be hard on them anyways. So I just, it's not necessary. They probably aren't going to want it. Cool their body down. Once their body starts to cool down, once they start um, panting normal, once they, that color of their, their gums is back to pink, um, once they start to get up and move, because they're, gonna, they're not going to want to move a lot when they're overheated. So once you start seeing some more normal behavior, put the food, put the water bowl out, but don't put cold, cold water in it or anything, just regular water, and they will rehydrate themselves. You don't have to do anything. They're pretty good at that. Now, when you're on the trail, and um, obviously we talked in the beginning, you know, we always want to try to prevent emergency situations. So um, one of the things that I like to do is stop more often when it's really hot, find, you know, shaded areas if possible. You know, when they're, you know, in the summertime, I try to actually um, find hikes that have some water on it or that are very much shaded so that I know that my dogs can, you know, cool off in the water, cool off in the shade. I would say be careful about having dogs cool off in bodies of water um, when you're out hiking and things only because they can get algae blooms that can be actually very detrimental to your pet. Yes, and, and that of course is another thing. It's important to be aware of the blue or green algae that can be very, very uh, poisonous to dogs and to exactly spot right. that. And, and unfortunately it seems like that's more and more, right? In more states, that is we, true. Went, we went to uh, Colorado, Utah, we saw um, that we unfortunately had, I know some incidences here in Arizona. So uh, that's another thing that's really, really important is to, um, I think, research and, and be aware of those types of situations. Absolutely. And here in Arizona, we also have a unique um, water type emergency that you start to see a lot in the summertime, and that's our canals. We get a lot of drownings in our canals of, of dogs, particularly. Um, last year, towards the end of the year, because we had an extended heat last year, I don't know what it was, but there was four dogs that died in the canals locally within a one week span, which is a lot. Um, but our canals are because they're water and our dogs wanna cool off, you know? So there again, that's something we have to be aware of. So I'm assuming it's because the dogs get in, but then unfortunately they can't get back out, right? Yes, so our canals are actually very, very dangerous. Um, they, they, are, they are built, uh, in a way, first of all, the water's moving very rapidly. You don't see it. You don't notice. You can't really tell. Um, they're also polluted with a lot of stuff, shopping carts, vehicle parts, old bicycles, all kinds of nasty crap that you can get tangled up in really easily. You know, even if you looked at it, it looks pretty benign. It looks like it's no big deal. You can get in, you can get out. You could probably, and there's a couple places where there's stairs and you think, yeah, you just get them over to the stairs. But that water's moving very, very rapidly. Um, I tell people in my class, as a firefighter in the state of Arizona, we rescue people out of those canals a lot. And that is a time where you can call 911 if a dog is in the canal. Do not go and get that dog. Call 911. The fire department will respond to that and they will rescue that pet. Um, they don't want you going in because it's very, very technical to get in and out of those. The sides develop a lot of algae and, and um, slime. And so even though they're concrete, what we can see above the water looks like you should have good purchase. You really, really don't. Yeah. And I have unfortunately had a, a rescue of a dog on, on a canal and it is, it is difficult. It is not an easy thing at all. 
I can see that. So one of the things that I know anybody always uh, talks about here in Arizona, of course, is rattlesnake bites. So any um, any thoughts on that preventative and maybe first aid? Okay, so when it comes to rattlesnakes in Arizona, it's not a hiking issue. A lot of people think that you know, if they don't take their dogs out for hikes, they don't have to worry about rattlesnakes. But more dogs in Arizona get bit by rattlesnakes in backyards than they do out on the trail. And I think part of that is because the rattlesnakes, particularly in the spring, come out of their out of their homes and they start sunning themselves on rocks and on pavement um, in order to kind of come out of their hibernation. And then it starts to be time for for mating and all of that. And so there, you know, you go a whole winter and you don't see a, a rattlesnake and you don't think much of it. And then one day your dog's out in the backyard and he sees something in the corner that's different and he goes over to investigate. And that's usually when they get struck by a rattlesnake. Once they're struck, once once a, your, your dog gets struck by a rattlesnake, if you suspect that's what's happened, if you can identify the snake, that's great. But I don't recommend going out to get the snake. Um, rattlesnakes can bite more than once. A lot of people think they can't, but they can. Um, they can strike twice the distance of their bodies from what I've been told. So if they're coiled up and they're about a two foot snake, they can strike up to four feet away. So you don't wanna get very close. If you can get a picture from a distance, remember you can always zoom in on your lens. You don't have to get close to get a good picture. Um, I tell people, if you have the time to get the picture, get the picture, because then you can identify the snake. Um, take care of your pet. Best ways to do this, get your pet away from the, the snake in the first place. Uh, keep them calm. It's huge. You want to keep their heart rate down as best you can. So keeping them calm, talk calmly to them. Um, you're going to be jacked up, so you're going to have to calm yourself down. You know, nice deep breaths and keep your pet very, very calm. As you calm your pet down, you're going to want to keep the bite uh, below the level of the heart if possible, which is going to be a challenge for most dogs because they're most often bit in the face. And that's because they stick their face in to see what's going on, right? Um, if they get bit in the face, take their collars off because their face is going to swell and you don't want to cut off their airway. So that's a really important part. You don't have to do anything to the wound itself. Um, just try to keep your pet calm and you need to get that pet to a veterinarian because the veterinarian is going to probably give that dog an antivenom or possibly some other type of medical treatment that's going to help alleviate the pain and distress. Yeah, and those are some really good tips. Now, I've also have talked to veterinarians, uh, and we had Dr. Sass now on the show. And, you know, one of the things that he talks about is that it's very important not to touch the wound because it is very, very painful for the dog. And even though a lot of times our dogs don't show that because they're not like people that they're, you know, you scream or something. So um, don't try to do anything to the wound is one of the things that he felt was very, very important to let people know because people want to do something or put water on it or suck the venom out or something. Don't do any of those things. That yeah. So old school was that you would, you know, cut it and then suck the venom out and then spit the venom out. Well, so that that's ridiculous. Let me explain why. So if you know anything about medicine, you know that if somebody's having a heart attack, you give them nitroglycerin to put under their tongue, right? The reason that works is because our, 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 our mouths are very vascular and it absorbs whatever we put in our mouth. So if you suck poison into your mouth, even if you spit it out, you are absorbing that poison immediately. So, and the other thing I tell people in my class is, you know, it's like trying to get a cup of coffee out of the ocean. If, if I were to walk over into the ocean and dump a cup of coffee and then tell you, go get that cup of coffee back out, you can't do it. So sucking that poison isn't doing a darn thing. It's just giving you some, some toxicity. Is all that's, really doing. that's a great, that's a great analogy, <laughs> Sue. I like that. Yeah. No. Yeah, absolutely. So again, and, and that speaks to what we said before is be prepared if, you know, as you were saying, I, and I think it's true. Um, and we also had somebody from Rattlesnake Ready on the show and, and they said the same thing you said. It's more than likely your pet is going to get bit in the backyard more than so on he the froze. trail. 
But um, if you're worried about, um, you know, anything that might happen on the trail, for one, keep your pet, you know, on the leash. Don't let them investigate under rocks and things like that. Um, because most of the time, I mean, rattlesnakes, they don't really want anything to do with anybody. They don't want to really bite anyone. They want to be left alone. So, um, right. you know, on the trail well, is probably less likely in the backyard is where we, we might move old furniture and all of a sudden there's a snake and we can't avoid it. Um, so yeah, that makes right. I love that you said to, to keep your dog on a leash when you're hiking. A lot of people don't. And I, I, I totally get that because I like to let my dogs run free too. I, I totally do understand. But you know, it if you have your dog on a leash, you have control over your dog. You can keep your dog out of a lot of trouble. So I, I like that you that you pointed that that particular thing out. Okay, so um, I know our uh, audience is um, waiting to hear where they can find you and how they can learn more about your classes or, you know, maybe even sign up for them. So share where people can get in touch with you. Okay, so there's two ways to, to, to find me on the internet. Um, I have my own website. It's www.petspets1st dot info so pets first dot info and if you put the www dot in there first you'll get me if you don't you'll get you know a bunch of different things first so i just tell them just www dot pets first dot info um that's my website and i have um, upcoming classes listed there and also just contact information. So if you just wanted to contact me because you wanted to put a class on, because I'll do groups of four or more anywhere. If, if somebody wants to put together a class at their location, that's fine. All they have to do is contact me and we'll set it up and arrange it. Um, if you're an individual or you don't want to go to the trouble of arranging something, um, I teach often over at a location called All Four pause training.com you go on their website that it'll bring up a whole list of different classes and i teach at that location so my class is listed in there um, you can sign up right there pay for it the whole nine yards and then just show up on the day that we teach the class yes and of course we're going to be sure to share the link or both links here in the description below so anybody can easily click on that and find you <laughs> um, one of the things so about your website it it's not just to sign up for classes you have all kinds of great information that you share in your website you have a blog you have uh, some other uh, resources there so um, even if you're not in phoenix and you can't be part of uh, sue's uh, courses please do stop by her website there's some great information there for anybody looking for first aid for pets yeah, thanks. And I have a lot of um, really interesting blogs. Uh, you know, I spent a year blogging um, safety message, prevention safety messages, and I learned a lot because I would do a lot of research and I was surprised. Uh, you know, I, I, I thought I had it all down, but there's always learning to be done. Okay. So, Sue, any uh, strange or unusual things that you can share that happened throughout your career of, um, you know, doing these classes? So it's interesting. What I have learned is that there's never you're never done learning. First of all, um, I have I have encountered some really interesting um, information about mostly prevention. Actually, online you'll see a lot of people post pictures of their dog or their cat with their head against the wall, and they make fun of the dog or the cat because it seems so weird and bizarre. I learned that that actually is a sign that the dog or the cat has a has a headache. And that there's possibly some kind of a neurological problem going on, that it's a medical problem. It's not funny at all. Oh, and wow. It's because, I've never heard that before. Right? Right? Yeah. Because we we think, we think um, because we don't understand something, it seems silly to us. Um, you know, why is my dog standing over there with his head against the wall? They're pressing. They're trying to counteract the pressure that's in their head by pressing against a hard surface. So they're actually in pain. It's a bad, if you see your pet doing that, that's a bad sign. That means something is up medically and you really should explore that. Now, cats will press their head against your body. That's a little bit different. That's, they're, they're not pressing. They're trying to get close to you. But if you see them against a, a wall, just standing there with their head pressed hard against the wall, that's actually a problem. And I had no idea. I had read that, um, 
when it comes to black widow spider bites on cats that they'll have a headache. And I thought, how in the world do you know when a cat has a headache? And that's when I learned that is that they'll press and dogs do that as well. So that was really, that was really good information for me personally. Another one that kind of came as a big surprise for me personally is how many dogs die and cats in wildlife actually die every day from mylar bags. So what's what a mylar bag? Dorito bags, potato chip bags, they're mylar. And what happens is uh, even when they're empty, they still smell really yummy and there's crumbs at the bottom and a pet will put their head in there and as soon as they do and they inhale, that bag sucks down onto their face and they cannot breathe and they panic and it does not take long and they die. And people will come home and find their pet with their head in, in a bag of some sort. And that's tragic. That's tragic. And, yeah. and the amazing thing is, is I'm a Dorito fan. And so I like to sit at my, you know, and eat and my dogs are well behaved and well trained and I can set that bag down and walk away, but that's a disaster waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. So I now, when I eat chips, I eat them in a bowl instead of in the bag that helps me to remember not to leave them where the dog can get them. When the bag is empty, I cut them because she's talking to a, a friend who's, who actually had this happen to them. They didn't eat chips, but a bag blew from somebody else's trash into their yard. So now I cut both sides of the bag. When I'm done, that bag is flat so that it cannot hurt uh, it, wildlife or somebody else's animal or my own. So those are, there's some strange stuff out there our animals can get into trouble with. And that's, that's one. I, I've talked to people and they think that the dog can just pull that bag off. They don't have thumbs. They can't. Yeah. So yeah. There's all kinds of crazy stuff like that, that that stuff, that's the kind of thing that would be on my blog that, that when I learn something like that, I usually will post that. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Good information. Yes. And Everybody that's available to aware of that. Yeah. And like you said, that's available to anybody, you know, awesome. you don't have so, to take my class. So again, we'll share the, uh, the links to the website in the description for anybody uh, to find your website and also the uh, four paws training website as well. So thank you so much. I know that our audience will enjoy hearing about um, all this information. You have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. You do the same. All thank right. you for having me. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. All right. Thank you, Sue. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us today on People with Passion for Pets. We're Jim and B. Walker, and we share the adventure of life with our dog Apollo and Heidi. For more adventure videos, check out our YouTube channel, Modern Canine Vlog, or visit our website, www.mcs.dog. And until next time, keep your paws on the road.